Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Hey, we're here to talk about the rule of law, which is under assault in many, many sectors, um, including by leadership. We have with us the Honorable Walter Kiramitsu, a former judge of the Hawaii Intermediate Court of Appeals and highly respected legal professional, former attorney, also for nine years, head of St. Louis School, president of the school, and many other contributing roles in the community. Also with us is Jeff Portnoy, a senior leading partner at Cade Shuddy, one of our largest and leading law firms, highly respected First Amendment attorney and constitutional scholar. So we've got the right people to talk about this. Gentlemen, even with the US Supreme Court in recess, it appears that the assault on the rule of law continues not only unabated, but if anything, escalated. Where do you see that happening that gives you the most reason for concern? Well, you said gentlemen, so you must be talking to Walter. <laughs> <laughs> Excluding myself. Jeff is the most knowledgeable, so we'll let Jeff go first. <laughs> well, you know, I think they're in two places right now. One, obviously, is the whole voting situation and voting by mail and all the challenges in the various states brought by both Republicans and Democrats, uh, obviously taking opposite positions on access to polling. I don't mean polling, polling, but I mean polling places. Uh, you know, the Republicans doing whatever they can to limit access to the ballot box and Democrats doing their best to try to increase access and eligibility to vote. And I think over the next 60 days, that is the single most critical assault on, on the rule of law, because in a democracy, if you can't have free and unfettered elections, you don't have the rule of law. And I think a secondary issue is what's going on in various cities. Uh, even though that's law on the streets uh, and what's going on with protests versus rioting versus counter protests versus who's creating the destruction uh, and whether they're, as the president likes to say, good people on both sides. So uh, I think those are the two most significant assaults on the rule of law as I see it right now. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Let me ask you folks a question. Because there are direct and indirect attacks on the rule of law and questions, serious questions have been raised about whether the electoral college system from several hundred years ago still really matches up with equal rights, equal voting access, and equal voting power. It certainly doesn't comport with one man or one person, one vote. And we've now had two elections in which the popular vote loser by millions of votes has won the electoral college by decisive margins. Could that happen again? And what's your view of that? Walter? Oh. Yes, I, I think uh, it could very well happen again, especially with this uh, with uh, this President Trump. Um, I, I think the Electoral College has been there for years for a reason, but the more we experience it uh, and we see a blatant um, uh, default on the part of uh, of the system. Uh, I think it's time to seriously consider uh, removal of the electoral college system and to revert back to the popular vote. One vote, one person, and just count the popular votes throughout the United States. So I think it's it's about time that we reconsider and reinstitute that um, that system. That's my view anyway. Yeah, well, no, I agree completely. The Electoral College is uh, a situation that is long overdue to be eliminated, not reformed, eliminated. Uh, it won't happen, however. 
obviously for political reasons. The Republicans know that they are completely out person and outvoted in the most populous states, New York, California, uh, even in states that are increasing in population like Arizona. Uh, Florida is another issue talking about the rule of law. <laughs> but as long as they can get the electoral votes that they can get out of the solid South and a couple of other states, I mean, this election in one way is kind of a joke because it doesn't matter what people in 44 states do. So why do we have to vote? Let's just take the five states that, uh, you know, are going to control who wins this election and let those five states vote and cast their electoral votes or even their popular votes. I mean, it, you know, it, it's, it's like slavery. It, it should have been outlawed a long, long time ago. To what extent is the electoral college vote manipulable by gerrymandering, voter suppression tactics like that? I don't think it is. I think, I think it, it, it indirectly is because it determines who gets elected to the House of Representatives. And so ultimately, you know, that's where law is made and in the Senate. But I don't think it has any kind of a direct impact on uh, the Electoral College. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I, I just think gerrymandering is a whole other issue. And we've talked about it before. And the Supreme Court, unfortunately, has weighed in on how they feel about gerrymandering. And, you know, to be honest, it's not a new phenomenon and it's not a Republican or Democrat phenomenon. I mean, whoever takes control of the state legislature is going to decide where the districts are going to be. And you got to give the Republicans a lot of credit over the last 20 years, because while the Democrats were focused on whatever they were focused on, the Republicans were focused on winning municipal and 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 uh, state elections and taking control of state houses. Now that's changing a little bit. They still have, I think, more governors, Chuck, than Democrats do. But I think the number is getting much closer. But, you know, to the victor uh, go the spoils. And if you're concerned about gerrymandering, then you better be more concerned about winning your state elections to your state houses of representatives and state senate. Yeah, and those are two separate issues, the gerrymandering and the electoral college. But, you know, like Jeff said, they're both... Um, um, you know, the, the, the uh, political parties are taking advantage of those two systems to their political advantage. Okay, so what, from your perspective, might be the best strategies for possible change in November? I'm not sure what you mean. Get one more vote, one more electoral vote than your opponent. Okay. That's the best strategy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And is that going to come down to those five or six swing states? What everybody's saying, right? I mean, I, I, I only know what you guys know from reading and watching TV. I mean, uh, there apparently are five or six states that almost every pundit believes will control the election. And they're essentially the same states that control the last one. Um, you know, there's a couple of states in the Midwest, Wisconsin and Michigan, uh, add North Carolina, Arizona, uh, Florida. Pennsylvania. Throw in one other state, Virginia. But I think most people think there's literally a handful of states and, and really 40 plus states are irrelevant with the Electoral College being the way it is. And to that point, uh, Chuck, uh, you know, we mentioned uh, attempts for uh, voter suppression. Uh, and we, we are aware of at least two separate federal cases that 
are pending in August uh, uh, last month. And one of them is uh, 20, 20 different states and the District of Columbia sued the Trump administration as well as the Postmaster General, Louis DeJoy, to reverse cutbacks to the postal system designed to undermine the agency's ability to deliver the expected ups upsurge in mail-in ballots this fall. And those, that law, those lawsuits are still pending. And then in addition, the separate uh, federal lawsuit, the Trump administration filed a federal lawsuit to invalidate vote by mail procedures in Pennsylvania, Nevada, and New Jersey, alleging that mail-in balloting will lead to massive fraud. Absolutely no evidence of that. So those two pending lawsuits have already reached the United States Supreme Court, and the U United U.S. Supreme Court has declined to take any action to halt the growing tide of voter, voter suppression. And that, again, is another form of an attack on the rule of law. And there's apparently no indication of any movement on the part of the Supreme Court to uh, decide this case before the November election. And so as a result, uh, you know, there's some question as to the validity of the election itself. I don't know whether President Trump is going to, uh, if he loses, uh, whether he's going to file a lawsuit to try to invalidate the um, voter results. So those are various serious questions on, on the direct attack on the rule of law. Well, actually, you know, Trump, as of yesterday, has now taken the opposite view of voter suppression. Oh. He wants people to vote more than once. So I don't, <laughs> I, I don't think that's suppression. I mean, he said yesterday in North Carolina, vote twice. Send okay, in well, your ballot, send in your ballot, and then on election day, go vote again. So, hey, he's trying to make people vote more than once. I think that's great. That's the opposite of suppression, isn't it? Yes, yes, I think so. <laughs> it, it happens to be to... a federal crime, by the way. But hey, that's never stopped Trump before. Yep. <laughs> and the other thing, uh, Chuck, you know, you mentioned what can we do about it. And uh, if we are trying to figure out something to do by the November election, that's quite... Uh, impossible to do it in that short time time frame but i noticed that um uh the new york city bar association has um planned a five-part forum on the threats to the rule of law which is scheduled to begin on september 15th so at least new york city and the bar association is making some attempt to voice their concerns on the attacks on the rule of law. So that is one form of um, venue or action that could be taken to quell, or at least to voice the concerns we have over the attacks on the rule of law. The attacks are on numerous fronts, not only voter suppression, but also on um, President Trump's attacks on the judges who rule against his uh, partisanship or his case. He's called the judges uh, Obama judges or other judges, you know, name calling of the judges. Uh, that's an attack on the rule of law. And also, um, he has called Congress, the investigation into the 2016 election. He used the word witch hunt. Um, and then also he pardoned, he, he's attempted to pardon through uh, Attorney General Barr, the Michael Flynn's case, and also uh, suspend the sentence of Roger Stone. Those are also attacks on the rule of law. So th there, there are numerous attacks on the rule of law by this administration on various, various fronts, which we should be concerned about. Uh, let me add one more that has just come out very recently, which is an indirect attack, but 
on a practical level, it might have severe impact, which is <laughs> Trump is now threatening to use his executive powers and administrative powers to basically substantially reduce funding to the states. And he's certainly fought against, through Mitch McConnell, any funding to the states to recover from the pandemic and its economic effects. <laughs> with the election coming up, with the load falling on the states to try to put measures in place to assure full free elections. That takes people, that takes work, that takes money. Hey, is it any accident that the federal funding restriction to the states and the cities is coming now just before the election? Well, you know, it's not gonna make much difference. The four cities he's threatening are all gonna vote democratic anyway. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's threatening Seattle, Portland, <laughs> And uh, New York City and Washington, D.C. I mean, is there any question? Uh, you know, since the popular vote doesn't matter, uh, you know, you can suppress all the vote you want. Uh, you can put those three states in the district in the Democratic <laughs> column. I, I can see if he was threatening to do that in, uh, in a state that was uh, going to be contested, like Wisconsin. Although with what's going on in, uh, you know, Kenosha and what had gone on in Milwaukee, who knows what he's going to do next? I mean, look, those of us who are our age remember 1968, 1972, the law and order campaigns of Richard Nixon. Uh, you know, those were bad enough. But even Nixon never had the audacity or the guts to do what this president has done in ignoring the rule of law. Walter's gone through a very brief list of some of the more obvious things that he does, but that's who he is. You know how many lawsuits Trump was involved in before he was elected president? They're, they're in the scores. I mean, he, you talk about abusing the legal system and threatening the legal system and using your money and the legal system to, your, to try to obtain an advantage. I mean, Trump is exhibit A. So why would it change when he became president? And he's exploring every loophole. He knows how slowly the courts move. He's now appointed 300 federal judges in less than four years. I mean, he has shaped the judiciary for the next quarter of a century. Fortunately, they're not all um, disciples, but they certainly share a lot of his political views, if not his moral and criminal views. So let me ask the question. In you folks' experience, and none of us are spring chickens, have you ever experienced a U.S. president who's been so overtly, blatantly corrupt in my prior life, it was Taft, I remember. There you go. But I was a different person then. <laughs> I, I, have never, I have never experienced the president of this, uh, of, this uh, of, of Trump's, you know, caliber. In the two months from today that we have to the election day, is there anything that you can see that might happen that might wake up people who still might be willing to have an open mind, make a decision? No. I think the debates will probably influence some people. And who knows what Trump might do. Maybe we'll get a vaccine tomorrow. Uh, and then he can trumpet that. Of course, most people aren't going to take it in light of all the controversy about its safety, which is a whole other problems. Look, you know, we live in Hawaii. We're, we're, we're immune to what's going on in the lower 48. Uh, we have to just accept the fact that this 35% of the people love Trump for one reason or another. It's mind boggling 
I watched a little bit of that rally in North Carolina yesterday and reminded me about Hitler. I mean, you know, there were a majority of people that loved Hitler. I mean, we, I just can't figure out how and why. You might like the fact that up until today, the stock market was going up. <laughs> but I mean, you can't, it's beyond me that a human being could, could approve of, of Trump as a person. And what he does as a person and as a president, regardless of economic policy. But folks, there's 35%, and that has not budged, right? Goes to 37, yep. it goes to 33. And there's 50% that hate him. Thank God. There's about <laughs> what? Eight to 10% that apparently either won't say or haven't made up their mind. <laughs> so now remember, re remember, Chuck, that, you know, President Trump has been quoted as saying that he, as president, has the absolute right to pardon himself for any crime. <laughs> okay? That in itself shows his total disregard for the rule of law. But the good news He's basically is saying, hey, I can commit any kind of criminal action and I'm, I can pardon myself. But the good news is the Justice Department says he can't be charged with a crime while he's <laughs> president. So we won't get that opportunity. <laughs> we'll see what happens January oh, it's, 21st. It's a, it's a two-stage two process. <laughs> right. So what do you think the factors are that might, between now and November 3rd, uh, affect swing state voters undecided voters, the debates, anything I think else? That'll be the most critical thing. And, uh, you know, things could go really haywire during the debates. I mean, there's always a chance that Biden loses his train of thought or misspeaks. On the other hand, there'll be a million fact checkers out there including Biden himself, who are going to have to call him on the, you know, call Trump on the carpet every time he makes a, a lie, which is almost every statement. So it'll be, you know, fascinating. Um, and then who knows? I mean, who knows what happens with the pandemic or, you know, the economy or, or they, they, they phony up some indictments which they've been working on now for over a year, the Republicans, you know, and indict Hillary Clinton or, you know, James Comey or, or, or uh, Hunter Biden or, you know, I mean, nothing's going to shock me. There's going to be some outrageous act on the part of the Justice Department and the president to try to skew the election in the last couple of weeks. I am convinced of that. Okay, so let me ask another question. How do you manage and control a debate with someone like Trump? He interrupts, he yells, he screams, he adheres to no rules. Well, you saw both of you, I'm sure that they had promoted or requested 12 different Fox News analysts to serve as hosts. And <laughs> none of their 12 got picked by the bipartisan committee. They picked four hosts, including Chris Wallace, by the way. Um, and now Trump and his people are screaming that the debates are already biased in the selection of the moderators. I mean, it's outrageous. It's, it's like every single day. They've already now said the debates are going to be one-sided because the bipartisan committee has selected Democratic-leaning moderators. I mean, it's That's 1984. Yeah. It's Animal yeah. Farm. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah, it is ridiculous. <laughs> I didn't realize they picked the four panelists. Who are the four panelists? Well, I don't. One's Chris Wallace. One is a woman White House reporter from NBC. Uh, one, I think, is a PBS person, and uh -huh. I don't remember the fourth. I see. But it's nobody that you see normally. You know, in the in the uh, slots on CBS, NBC hosting the news or no one from CNN, no one from MSNBC. I mean, it, you know, 
looks so they like didn't a pick... fairly legitimate group of moderators, but how they're going to control Trump? Impossible. Impossible. Yeah, if I were doing a mediation, I think the only way to manage a conversation like that, a debate like that, would be you allocate a specific amount of time. When that time ends, that person's cut off. You go to the other one, they get that. have to cut their mic off. Yeah. And then you know what Trump will say as soon as it's over? It's a, it's a, it's a no-win proposition. Yes. <laughs> But we know what he will do. And unless they set up something that controls that, that manages that effectively. The only thing that'll control that is an electrical shock. <laughs> <laughs> they need I think to wire that, him up. And if he goes <laughs> over, press the button. I think time management is the, <laughs> is the key. <laughs> okay. And as we come down into our last couple of minutes here, any parting thoughts? Where do we go from here? What are your hopes, your wishes, your advice to the country? Walter, they're all waiting for you. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't have any wise advice. So I, I would defer to Jeff Portnoy. He's the, he's the guy we should be following. No, I just think we just hang on for the next 60 days. Every day will be something different and then everybody's got to get out and make sure they get a vote and make sure that vote's counted. And then we'll let the courts decide who wins this presidency, I think, unfortunately. So Walter, to finish us up for today, as people go to vote, what do you think they should have first in mind? I think the first in, in issue in mind is to main, to return or re maintain the integrity and the honor of the office of presidency and vice president is right now there is serious question as to you know the position of the president and vice president their role and how they respect the rule of law so that all involves integrity and um, impartiality and what the voters should keep in mind is how to be preserve integrity and impartiality and the honor of the position of president and vice president. Thanks, Walter. Thanks, Jeff. We brought us back to where we started months ago. It's <laughs> integrity, independence, and impartiality. Take those to the voting booth and make them work for all of us. Thank those you. Are, those are Chuck. Crompton's three eyes. <laughs> we need three eyes. Thank you right. all. All right. Thank you. Take it easy. Okay.